we're going to talk about dissolved oxygen and temperature. Um, next will be score the shore, then a break, and then we'll end our day with the exotic aquatic plant watch. Um, can somebody just let me know if you can hear me okay? Is the volume all right? You look and sound great. Thank you. So we'll get started. As I said, this is the training for dissolved oxygen and temperature. Welcome. Uh, for those of you who might not have watched the introduction, my name is Tamara Lipsy, and I'm an aquatic biologist with the Michigan Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Energy. Um, I've worked here for 19 years, but I've been the program lead for Eagle My Corps for just a year and a half or so. Um, I did present this last year, so if you're seen again, welcome back. Um, I wasn't able to meet any of you last year, but I did meet a few of you at the MLSA conference last weekend, and I look forward to meeting more of you in the future. I live outside of Lansing on the west side in a small town called Grand Ledge with my husband and two boys who are 12 and 15. We love the outdoors and spend a lot of time on lakes, rivers, streams, inland lakes, and lake, uh, the Great Lakes in Michigan. Um, I've been hard at work calibrating all the DO probes. I didn't uh, do it in my home this year. I was able to do it in our field office. Um, I myself frequently conduct dissolved oxygen and temperature sampling as part of my position here at Eagle. This coming summer, um, we're doing a national, we're participating in a national inland lake study. So I'm sure I will be doing it for part of that. Um, I also conduct aquatic insect and fish surveys, among other things. But we're here to talk about dissolved oxygen and temperature. And we're going to start by talking about why it's important. Then we'll uh, go over. Um, how DO and temperature program works here in the CLMP program. And then I'll go over our procedures and equipment that we'll be using to assure that we have consistent and high quality data. And finally, I'll talk about what to do at the end of our sampling season. So what does DO and temperature measure? Uh, temperature measures just what you think it does. It measures how warm or cold the water is. And dissolved oxygen measures how much oxygen is dissolved in the water and therefore is available for aquatic organisms to use. Why is DO and temperature important? Um, well, it affects and is affected by many different physical, chemical, and biological components of a lake. And as I said, it, it impacts what type of organisms can live in your lake. And the next few slides and videos will explain more about temperature and dissolved oxygen. And then we'll return back to this question. First, I'm going to talk a little bit about temperature and thermal stratification, and then we'll watch a video on um, how temperature impacts the physics of water. So by measuring temperature, you can determine how your lake stratifies. And this is a diagram of a common temperature profile of a lake in the summer months here in Michigan and how it stratifies. So the upper layer is called the epilimnion, and it is warmed by the warmer air that comes in the summer and by the heat that the sun provides. The epilimnion also includes this littoral zone, which is that zone um, where plants grow that's closer to shore. And they grow well because sunlight can usually reach uh, the bottom and they can then use the sunlight to grow. The wind um, helps keep this zone fairly uniform in temperature. 
um, in, in the waves. Um, so it's all pretty much one temperature. And then the next zone is called the metalimnion and it includes an area we call the thermocline, which is where there's a pretty sudden decrease in temperature. Um, the metalimnion is usually uh, a little bit thinner. It doesn't go quite as deep. And then underneath that is the bottom zone, which is called the hypolimnion, and that's the coldest layer. And deeper lakes in temperate areas like Michigan often stratify into these layers in the summer, thanks to the physical properties of water. And we'll Next, watch a video to get a visual of that stratification. Imagine you're swimming at the lake on a hot summer day and your friend says, hey, I bet you can't touch the bottom. And you're like, I bet you I can. So you take a deep breath and you swim down and down and down and suddenly it gets cold and you stop. What is this? What's going on? You've just experienced something that's hugely important to everything that goes on in the lake. It's called thermal stratification. After you get back to the surface and catch your breath, you think, why is it warm up here but cold below? Is it always this way? Let's run an experiment and find out. What we have here is a model of a lake cut in half down the middle. We've taken all the warm water, dyed red, and moved it to one side. The cold water, dyed blue, is moved to the other side. In the middle is this barrier that keeps the sides separate. Now let's remove the barrier and watch what happens. As you can see, there's a lot of movement between the two layers as they come together. But look, the warm water has settled out on top. Let's try the experiment again. This time we put the cold water on the left and the warm water on the right, just to see if it makes a difference. Once again, the warm water settles out on top. What's going on? To answer that, we need to take a look at the physical principle driving the whole show, density. Density is the amount of stuff in a given volume. In our case, that stuff is water, and that volume is this glass beaker. This beaker is filled to the brim with our cold water. Let's see how much it weighs. hundred and sixty six point two grams. Now we've emptied the cold water and refilled the beaker with the warm water and the warm water weighs in at 165.1 grams, a little bit less than the cold water. We can calculate the density of these two samples by dividing the mass by the volume. First we need to correct our previous measurement by subtracting out the mass of the empty beaker. This gives us 116.2 grams for the cold water and 115.1 grams for the warm water. Now we divide by the volume of the beaker to get a cold water density of 1.00 grams per milliliter and a warm water density of 0.99 grams per milliliter. In reality, it's a very small difference, but that small difference has a big impact. It allows the warm water to essentially float on top of the cold water, and it keeps the two layers from mixing together. So what affects the temperature, and in turn, the density of the water in the lake? You might think the temperature of the air surrounding the lake is the answer, but really, the biggest impact comes from the sun. 
As sunlight enters a lake, it warms the surface water, making it less dense and lighter. As the surface water begins to float on the cold water below, a transition zone forms where it changes from warm to cold very quickly. We call that the thermocline. Remember, thermal stratification in lakes is as ordinary as the changing of the seasons. And in fact, it does change with the seasons. But we'll save that for another time. For now, know that warm water, cold water, and a thing called density set the stage for the behavior of, well, really everything that goes on in a lake. It's very important. So I really enjoy that video. It takes me back to high school a little bit. Um, I know um, about uh, thermal stratification, but uh, just taking a minute to remember the why is always good. So now we've been able to see visually what happens during the summer, which is shown in the upper left. So we'll, we'll take a look at what happens during the other parts of the year in many Michigan lakes. As the air temperatures start to drop in the fall and the sun gets lower on the horizon, the water temperature of the lake begins to fall. And in addition, the fall winds have the tendency to mix the water and add to the cooling effects of the air. So the colder water, because it's more dense, begins to sink and it pushes the now warmer water up towards the surface. And as that happens, um, the nutrients and um, more oxygenated water is brought to the surface. And this is called, called turnover. As we get into winter, the water keeps cooling and it mix, keeps mixing and cooling until the whole lake reaches less than four degrees Celsius, which is about 39.2 degrees Fahrenheit. And at that point, the water gets lighter and goes to the top and eventually freezes at zero degrees Celsius. So then the water underneath the ice layer is warmer. And then although the temperature range is pretty small, um, it's important because it allows fish and other organisms whoops, to survive. Then we'll get, uh, and then um, in the spring, the, the sun is higher in the sky again, the temperatures rise, and um, the winds help mix the, the lake, and that turnover happens again when that water warms, it becomes less um, dense and stays at the top. And the warm, the colder water, um, oh, oh, let me start again. <laughs> so in the spring, as the ice melts, it reaches that four degrees Celsius. So it gets heavy again, it's no longer floating on the top. And it falls to the bottom and the warmer water is pushed to the top. And that's when the turnover happens. And then the nutrients and the oxygen are again mixed throughout the water column. And this cycle happens every year in areas of the country where they don't experience much temperature change. Um, lakes can mix like this year round, not just in the spring and the fall. Okay, so now we're gonna switch gears a little bit and talk about dissolved oxygen. And again, I found a neat video that explains it uh, way better than I could. So we will watch that now. Imagine a world where we weren't surrounded by air. Without the oxygen in the air that we breathe, we wouldn't survive very long. But what about animals underwater? They need oxygen too. Where do they get it? The answer is from the water. 
because water actually also contains dissolved oxygen. Dissolved oxygen is just what it sounds like. It's oxygen that's dissolved in water. But what does it mean for something to dissolve? If you've ever mixed sugar in water, you've noticed that the sugar seems to disappear. But what really happens is that the molecules of water mix with and surround the sugar molecules, breaking up the large sugar granules to make a sugar-water mixture. More specifically, since the parts of the mixture are spread out equally and evenly everywhere, we can call this mixture a solution. So when we say that something dissolves, it just means that it goes into an evenly distributed mixture called a solution. Now like those sugar molecules, oxygen molecules also mix evenly with water molecules to form a solution. In other words, oxygen dissolves in water. But how does the oxygen get there in the first place? Well, there are two main ways that oxygen can enter a body of water, like the ocean or a lake. One way is from the atmosphere, or the air around us. Oxygen makes up about a fifth of the atmosphere, and these oxygen molecules are constantly bumping into and entering water. Even more oxygen enters water through photosynthesis. You probably know photosynthesis mainly as the way that plants around us feed themselves. But there's actually a whole slew of other photosynthetic living things aside from plants. From tiny green bacteria called cyanobacteria, to little phytoplankton with crazy names like dinoflagellate and even crazier bodies. All these creatures can produce food through photosynthesis. But in doing so, they actually also produce oxygen, which then dissolves in the water. What happens to this dissolved oxygen? Remember that like us other living things, the animals, plants, phytoplankton, and bacteria living underwater also take up oxygen to live. Furthermore, oxygen molecules are continually shuttling back and forth between the atmosphere and the water. But note that there's always at least some amount of oxygen that stays dissolved, and this amount depends on water conditions like the saltiness and temperature of water, and how much dissolved oxygen there is compared to the oxygen levels in the air. Now why does the amount of oxygen already dissolved in the water and the surrounding air matter? Well, it's the same principle as walking into a crowded room from an empty hallway. You don't want to go in, and the people inside are trying to get out. In the same way, if there's more oxygen in the water than in the surrounding air, then the oxygen moves to the roomier atmosphere. Or if there's more oxygen in the air, then the oxygen moves to the water. The principle is the same for the saltiness of water. If you've ever tasted seawater, you know how salty it is, and that's because there's salt dissolved in seawater. Well, those salts are also taking up space in the water. You can imagine that as adding even more people to your crowded room, and the more people there are, the less room there is for you. So the saltier it is, the less space there is for dissolved oxygen. What about temperature? Well, when things heat up, they start moving around. Imagine yourself in a crowded room again. As everyone starts jostling around, it's a lot easier to move out of the room. Again, it's the same for dissolved oxygen. The oxygen molecules warm up and they start vibrating, making it easier for them to escape the water. So let's sum that up. Dissolved oxygen enters water from the atmosphere and from photosynthesis, and then gets taken up by living things or exits into the atmosphere depending on water temperature, saltiness, and the amount of already dissolved oxygen. Now you're probably thinking, who cares what the amount of dissolved oxygen is? Well, remember that living things need oxygen to live, and the more oxygen there is, the more animals can live there. So scientists measure dissolved oxygen to find out how healthy a body of water like a lake or a river is. But animals also adapt to the amount of dissolved oxygen. Fish like salmon need a lot of oxygen so they can only live in colder places, but fish like catfish can live in warmer waters because they need less oxygen. If you've ever wondered why the kinds of fish are different in different places, this is one reason why. Unfortunately, even these fish die off at very low oxygen levels, and humans have been decreasing freshwater oxygen levels in a process called eutrophication. Eutrophication is a big word that just means adding a lot of nutrients good for growing, like nitrogen and phosphorus, to a lake or a river, usually by pollution. That causes a lot of plants and cyanobacteria to bloom. Aren't plants good though? Don't they produce dissolved oxygen? Well yes, but when they die, they sink to the bottom of the lake and decay there, and this decay uses up all the oxygen in the lake. With no oxygen to breathe, the fish and other animals die and the lake becomes unhealthy. So throw your trash properly and recycle! Together we can preserve our marine and freshwater ecosystems.
Okay, so I really like that video, um, except for the end, because although recycling is great, it's not necessarily going to help with eutrophication. However, they make a lot of good points, and we will review those. Um, first, the amount of salt and the temperature of the water impact the amount of dissolved oxygen in the water. Oxygen enters the water through the air or by photosynthesis from plants and algae. If there's too much algae or cyanobacteria, it can lead to low dissolved oxygen because when they die, that uh, takes up oxygen out of the water. Nutrients can speed up the growth of plants and algae and thus the eutrophication process. And understanding DO levels in your lake is one more tool to understanding the health of your lake. And the dissolved oxygen meters that all of you are using don't quite look like this one, but they do allow you to measure that DO and temperature in your own lake. So back to the question of why dissolved oxygen and temperature are important. We measure these parameters to define where the thermal layers are and then to classify your lake as warm or a cold water lake. We use these measurements to determine what types of fish the DO levels will support and what depths they can live at. And the dissolved oxygen levels can be an indicator of nutrient releases and a trophic state, state into trophic state indicator. So when you uh, collect your data, this is what it'll look like. It's an example of a graph that you will be able to make with your temperature and DO data. You'll receive these graphing template sheets and you'll be able to plot the temperature, which is shown with the triangles and the dissolved oxygen, which is shown here with the circles. So in this graph, you can see that the DO is right around nine milligrams per liter. Let's see if I can get my laser pointer to work. So it's right around uh, nine milligrams grams per liter up until about a little over 20 feet deep where it starts to decline. And then by 35 feet, the dissolved oxygen is less than one, which would not support any fish. Most warm water fish species need at least four to five milligrams per liter of oxygen where cold water fish need as much as eight um, milligrams per liter. So now we'll move over to the temperature. It's in degrees Celsius, degrees Celsius. At the water surface, which is the epilimnion, it's about 20 degrees Celsius, which is about 68 degrees Fahrenheit. And I forgot to point out that this is a late summer profile. So it um, was taken in September. So similar to the dissolved oxygen, the temperature stays pretty steady. And then in that thermocline, um, it starts to decrease pretty rapidly and keeps doing that until um, it evens out about 40 feet. So then the temperature evens out. And it's chilly down there at uh, eight degrees Celsius, which is about 46 degrees Fahrenheit. So with this information, we can see that uh, Spider Lake or Dead Spider Lake, which is in Lake County, was stratified with the epilimnion at top, the metalimnion or the thermocline right there in the middle, and then the hypolimnion at the bottom. And as Paul noted in his um, talks, uh, talk to today, you will receive at the end of the year report. And part of that report will be um, the same data graphed after it's been entered um, into our database. So this is a late summer again, a September profile of Lotus Lake in Oakland County. 
And again, it's a good example of a warm water lake here in lower Michigan in the late summer. And it's stratified like the previous um, example. And then the values on the right, as Paul said, um, is the trophic state information. So I'm not going to spend time on that since they already did, but I will say that the dissolved oxygen and temperature is another piece of information important for your lake. Here's another example. Lake Independence is in the Upper Peninsula in Marquette County. And this is a, a late August profile, but, and you can see it's not a very deep lake. It only goes to about 25 feet. Um, and because of this, it's able to maintain a constant DO level and temperature all the way to the bottom of the lake. One more example is an example of a deep lake. This is Higgin lake, Higgins Lake in Roscommon County. The temperature stays stable till almost 50 feet where the thermocline begins. However, although the temperature drops, the DO uh, remains really high. And from the trophic state information collected, we know that the lake has low nutrients. And because it has low, lower nutrients, it means there's less plants and algae and less productivity. So the DO levels are able to remain high because although they're plants, there's not so many that they use up the oxygen during the night or by decomposing. And the DO levels get even higher right here in that thermocline because the temperature has decreased and it allows for more oxygen, oxygen oxygen molecules to enter the water. So Higgins Lake can support a cold water fishery because they have high oxygen levels in cold temperatures. Okay, so that was a lot of intense science stuff. Um, so we're gonna give that part of our brain a break and switch over to how DO temperature monitoring program works and how uh, the equipment you'll be using and how to use it. Are there any questions, um, Jill, that I could answer before I move on? This is a good kind of break point. The only question that came in so far was whether um, people could still sign up. And I responded in the chat that no, the, the deadline for dissolved oxygen and temperature was back in April, um, April 1. So um, if this interests you and you're not enrolled this year, um, please plan on it for next year. Right. Yep. And I can still, you know, if you want more details before next year, um, this is actually, you know, an opportunity to ask me some questions before you dive into it next year. Okay. So first, everyone is going to need a meter. And we have about 30 working meters that people can um, check out essentially pay a fee and borrow a meter from us. I handed a lot of these out at the MLSA conference this last weekend. Um, some were given to other kind volunteers who were willing to help distribute them. A couple of you are getting them shipped to you because um, you're further away and didn't have another lake near you. So you should, everyone should get their meter in one way or another by the end of next week, I would think. Um, in some years, we might need you to share with other lakes, but that's not the case this year. We had enough for everyone, just enough. It was, it's always, that was a little interesting to me. Um, some lakes have, many lakes actually, have chosen to purchase their own meter and they run about $1,000 a piece and that includes the monitor and then a cord with the sensor. Um, if you think you want to do this, um, talk to us prior to purchasing because we want you to purchase the same kind so that our data is um, has that quality assurance that we want. You're going to be measuring uh, your dissolved oxygen and temperature twice a month, uh, starting in mid-May through mid-September. We right now have two types of monitors. The older model is called uh, YSI, which is the company 550A. And the newer model is called a Pro 20. 
And both will come with um, like a storage box of some kind. They'll come with the DO temperature probe and cable and the cable comes in various lengths. Um, hopefully the people who have the deep, deep lakes got the 200 foot meter ones and um, then we have sh um, shorter ones. The probe and the cable are connected with the 550A model where it, it can be disconnected with the newer model. It'll come with batteries inside the meter already and then spare batteries. It also has an agreement letter to sign and return to me. Um, you can take a picture of it and email it to me, that's fine. So then you have a copy and I have something as well. It also will come with a quick start calibration card to remind you how to calibrate it. And it finally, it comes with an extra dissolved oxygen membrane and an electrolyte solution that's needed when you change the membrane. And we'll get into more of that in a minute. So here's just another view of both of those meters, the 550A with the, the cord is connected and can't, can't be unconnected. Um, this is the cord, it has a little, this one has a, weight on it. Some people find that the weight um, is helpful during um, windy days, but hopefully you're not going out in too windy of days. That's not ideal. Um, and then here's the probe with a cover on it. Same here. Here's the cord. Here's the probe. And the cover is this gray piece right here. Here is what the probe looks like when we take the cover off. This is the cover. And then there's like a, we call it a cage that protects the membrane. And then the membrane itself goes over the oxygen um, probe that's in the middle there. Uh, we don't want you to touch the yellow portion, which encloses the membrane because it can be damaged really easily. It's very fragile. This shows uh, a a little bit different membrane cap, but um, the reason that we show this one is because right here, that little silver part, you can see that's uh, the thermistor and measures the temperature. So first we want you to prepare for sampling. Um, like I said, make sure you have a calm and dry weather conditions. Pack up your equipment, including all your safety equipment, and take a friend with you to help with data recording. Check out the quick reference procedure checklist just to remind yourself of everything you need to do. Make sure you have your data forms with you and make sure you connect your cable to the meter if you have a Pro 20. And then in, in with both the 550A and the Pro 20 meter, you want to turn on your meter for 15 minutes and let it warm up. It doesn't take quite as long with the Pro 20, but just for simplicity's sake, turn it on for about 15 minutes and then you'll calibrate it using your quick start guide. So now I'm going to show you two videos that show you how to calibrate your meter. Here's the one for the uh, Pro 20. Maybe I gotta... Is it going? Maybe we'll try over here. There we go. Mm -hmm. This video is to show you how to calibrate your YSI Pro 20 dissolved oxygen and temperature meter. It's really pretty simple. First, you want to check inside the cap that covers your probe and make sure that the sponge that's inside is wet. Always want to keep the environment for the deal probe moist, but it shouldn't be standing water. You just put that back on and then turn the unit on. It 
You'll see at the top here, there's two measurements. One says milligrams per liter, mg slash l. One says, says percent. The percent is the percent saturation, how much oxygen is in this, con this container right now. And then the milligram per liter is what you'll be measuring when you put the probe into your lake. The uh, temperature units are in degrees Celsius, which is what you want. And to calibrate, really all we have to do is hit this button here, uh, press it, and then hold for about three seconds. And then it will say calibrating percent dissolved oxygen until it says calibration successful. And then you're all set. Notice it did go away, the calibration successful. So if it's taking some time and you look away, you might miss that. But if you wanted to double check, all you do is hit calibration again, hold it, calibrating, calibration successful and you're ready to go. Have fun. And uh, here is the video for the 558. Hello, this video is to show you how to calibrate your YSI 550A dissolved oxygen and temperature meter. If you have a YSI Pro 20, there's a separate video for that. The first thing to do is to turn on your unit and then let it set for about 15 minutes. I've already done that. The next thing you want to do is make sure that the sponge inside your probe cap is moist. There shouldn't be standing water, it just needs to be slightly wet. If it's dry, Make sure you put a couple drops of water in there and then replace the cap. The next step in calibration is to hit both the down arrow and the up arrow at the same time. When you do that, you will get CAL for calibration. You then hit enter. Once you hit enter, a number will come up. This is where you will enter the elevation of where your lake is. In the Lansing area, the elevation is about 900 feet, so there's a 9. However, if I was somewhere else and the elevation was, let's say, 700, I would put the down arrow twice to get to 7. If it was 1,000, I would move it up a couple to get it to 10, and so on. Once you have the correct elevation, hit Enter again, and your unit will begin calibrating. It'll jump around quite a bit. Mine is not because I have been, had this meter on for a while and it's had time to stabilize already. So you can see it's just jumping between two tenths, 0 0.1 to 0 0.2, 94.1 to 0 0.2. Your percent saturation should be between 93 and 98%. If it's not, keep waiting and if it still does not, then you'll need to turn it off and try again. But since we seem to have a stable, stable number and it is between those numbers, I press enter. The next thing that comes up is the percent salinity. We have fresh water in Michigan, so we don't need to worry about this. So just make sure it says zero and hit enter again. And there you go. You're all set. Before you go out and measure dissolved oxygen in your lake, however, you need to change the units from percent saturation to milligrams per liter. And you do that just by hitting the mode button once and it changed to milligrams per liter. I see it's in degrees Celsius, which is what you want for the data sheets that we give you. If it says degrees Fahrenheit, all you need to do is hit the mode button and the down button at the same time, and it will change to Fahrenheit. Hit it again, both the arrow, down arrow and mode, and it will change back to degrees Celsius. Now you're all set.
have fun measuring your dissolved oxygen in your lake. So both of those videos are available online and you can refer to them whenever you need. Um, like I said, a spare membrane cap and probe solution is included with your kit. Um, should your meter not calibrate for some reason. Um, over the winter, I do replace the um, membrane on every one, um, but things happen. So if your meter is not calibrating, you can try replacing your um, membrane. The solution that you are given will go inside that um, membrane cap. And please throw out the old membrane if you use it um, so that I know when it's turned in that it needs a new extra um, membrane. I do have a video for that, but we're not going to um, look at it today for time's sake. But again, if you need to change your membrane, I do have a video available on our website. So now you're going to proceed to the sampling location. And as uh, Eric explained earlier, you wanna anchor just upwind of the deep basin and drift over that deepest spot so that you don't have uh, suspended sediment in the water. Check your depth to make sure you're in the right place. Um, if you haven't already turned on your meter, go ahead and do so. Let it set for 15 minutes, especially if you have a 550A and calibrate it. And then you're gonna take that cap off, but leave the guard or the cage that I mentioned earlier. And you're going to begin sampling at one foot deep for your first measurement. When you're taking a measurement, uh, you might want to just move the probe a little bit, kind of like you're digging for some fish or something. Um, it just helps the water flow through the cage. Uh, you don't need to jiggle it hard, just a really um, like a nibbling of a fish. Um, and then uh, you'll take your reading, write it on your data sheet to the nearest milligrams per liter, and then go to the next depth on your data sheet. And you just wanna make sure you stop about two to three feet above the sediment or the bottom to protect the probe. If you accidentally get it in the sediment, um, just make sure you wash it out real well with, uh, by swooshing it in the water at the top. This is what your data form looks like, uh, pretty similar to some of the other data forms that you have. It has your weather conditions, um, what type of meter that's important, um, your meter ID number, which should be on the outside of the box that you received if you're borrowing one of ours. If it's your own meter, just put on there our, our meter. And then if you have a 550A, it's important to put what the percent air saturation was to make sure that we know that it calibrated. And then you can put your lake elevation value in here if you have a 558. That is not needed if you have a Pro 20. It has uh, it measures the barometric pressure and knows um, that information already. Um, I did include in the boxes um, a page that lists your lake and the elevation um, that I could find for your area. Uh, there's another area to draw the outline of your lake and mark where you're sampling at. And this is uh, page two of the data sheet, which has all the depths that you'll be taking measurements at. Um, there is a memory function on your meters. Don't use it. Just record your readings right away. And make sure uh, your temperature is in degrees Celsius and your dissolved oxygen is in milligrams per liter. And you're going to record the um, measurements at five feet intervals through that epilineon. And then that, the goal is to measure it more often during the thermocline because it will drop more quickly. And then eventually it'll even out and then you go back to five foot intervals for the rest of your lake. 
Um, you can go within a foot of the bottom, just to avoid touching that bottom sediments. And when you have um, completed all your sampling, just uh, turn off the meter, replace that plastic sleeve, which is either gray or probably clear um, with that wetted sponge and store it in a box, in the box, in a cool, a cool dark area. You, we don't want you leaving them on your boat in the heat all day. That's not going to be good for them. So just maybe put them in your garage where it's cooler and dark until you need it again. So as I talked about earlier, after you have all your DO and temperature measurements, if you want to uh, see right away what your thermocline looks like, you can do this and fill out the graphs. Um, you'll just go to what depth you had and what your dissolved oxygen number was, and then make a separate graph with the depth and what the temperature was. Um, we want you to submit the data, as Paul and Eric said, online using the instructions that are on our website. Um, if you can, please, um, if you enter your data um, by October 31st or mail that data to Jean, uh, make a copy for yourself, and then there's the address to mail that in, which will be at the, it's at the bottom of the data sheets, all the data sheets to remind you. So at the end of the year, um, when you turn in your last uh, water chemistry sample, so your phosphorus sample, which is usually in September for most of the state and August for the northern part of the state. Just the easiest thing is to just please bring your dissolved oxygen meter in at the same time. Uh, last year, a lot of people did not do that. So try to mark that on your calendar with your last phosphorus sample to turn in your DO meter as well. Um, if you forget or if you're in the UP, um, some of those more northern areas and you want to dis measure dissolved oxygen further into September, just call me to make arrangements. And just make sure that that sponge is always damp and not pooled with water. Using tap water is fine, just as long as it's clean water. And we have come to the end of the presentation and have some time for questions. Uh, thank you very much for attending. And I'm always available for questions. Um, if I don't get back to you right away, I'll try to get back to you as soon as I can. And here's my email and my phone number. So are there any questions out there? Thanks, Tamara. There are a few uh, questions out there. Um, so let's take a peek at those. Um, and I'm able to help with, with a couple of them. So the hey, first question from, um, from Craig asks, what is the highest level of oxygen supersaturation you have ever seen? Um, and I can provide a little background on that. Um, supersaturation is a situation that happens when um, the water actually will be measured as having more than 100% of the expected amount of oxygen in it for that particular temperature. And as Tamara was talking uh, about the different um, the two different settings on the DO meters, it can measure concentration, milligrams per liter, or saturation, which is a percentage. We don't measure saturation. Um, we have right. you switch it back over to concentration, which is milligrams per liter. So we don't have saturation data in our database. Um, so that's not something that we can really tell you or share um, information about saturation. No, and when even when I'm out in the field, I really don't honestly pay attention to saturation much. Um, I just pay attention to the value because that's the important part for the aquatic organisms living there. I've been doing some spring sampling in many of our cold water rivers this spring and the highest I've gotten so far, the lowest we've gotten was in the 10 range and the highest was 11.5 or so, but that's at 49 degree uh, temperature water too. Amber and Joe, the reason I asked the question is we purchased a meter last year, and it was a brand new meter. And being a chemist, I don't trust <laughs> things out of the box. 
And I was getting levels of like 18, 19 parts per million, which exceeds the maximum of 14.8 at temperature of freezing. And that's why I specifically asked the question, because when I see numbers like that, I start wondering, well, is this meter recording correctly? Even though when I test it in ice water, I get 14.8 parts per million, which is what it should be. That's why I asked the question. If I was getting something like that, Craig, at the beginning of, you know, when I'm calibrating, I would ask, I would, I would go right to the, um, to the, the meter, source of where you got it from. Yeah, the and, meter calibrates fine. But it's just like, I was surprised to see that extent of super saturation, you know, like right in the thermal client area. That's why I was asking. Okay. Was well, it unreasonable? I, <laughs> That's the question. <laughs> and I, I honestly can't answer that for you. I'm not that familiar oh. with it. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. I, areas of high photosynthesis. Mm -hmm. That's where we can, um, get super that's where we commonly get super saturation and if you you gave a clue there so you you had it near the thermal cline and so you can get something that develops called an algal plate and uh, it's a great place for algae to grow because there's still enough sunshine down there but they might be getting some leakage of nutrients from uh, the hypolimnion as well as just the density gradient so you can get this buildup of algae there and you can have with now pressure from being deeper in the water, you can get uh, pretty high supersaturation. Wow. Yeah. I so that might actually, that. Thanks, that might Eric. Not, it's cool. <laughs> that might not actually be a surprise, Craig, if you were seeing that at the thermocline. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Eric. No problem. All right. The next question from Sandy Can I borrow the DO equipment from you so that those that are not signed up can monitor for their own records? Quick answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not, I guess I, 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 I had a little time to, to think about the one. question. Yeah, I had a little time to think about it. So I think what they were hoping for is to be able to use our meters and loan them out to other people who might just want to monitor dissolved oxygen in their own lakes. Oh, we, have no. a, we have a pretty limited selection uh, of, of DO meters, and we really have to keep them um, used only by our enrolled volunteers that have paid the enrollment fees and have gone through the training. Um, these, these meters cost about $1,500 a pop, so we're pretty protective of them also. So loaning them out um, beyond where the people that have signed the agreements and gotten the training is something we're trying to avoid. Thanks for handling that one, Joe. I would have had to reread it a couple of times. So <laughs> sure, <you>. yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you there. No, that's um, good. Yeah, so we had a couple other questions. One, a quick one, what is the rental cost for an oxygen meter? Um, we have two different enrollment fees for uh, participating in dissolved oxygen and, and temperature monitoring. If you use your own meter, so that's not a rental, the cost for a year is $30. If you borrow one of our meters, that's $60. So basically there's $30 on top of the basic enrollment fee if you wanna use one of our, our meters. So as a, a volunteer who I just delivered at one of our meters to yesterday said, that's a pretty darn good deal. I'd have to monitor for a lot of years to pay off a $1,500 meter. So um, that's that's the uh, the process. I mean, the nice thing is if you have your own, then you can you know use it whenever you want, however you want, with as many people as you want. Um, so that's the, uh, that's the benefit of that. So good question. Yeah. All right. A question from Ellen. I asked earlier about runoff from road salt. Tamara mentioned that these <laughs> meters measure salinity. Would that be useful to do? They, I thought about that question when I was talking about, when that video was talking about salt, um, they, these meters do not measure salinity. It's just if there's more salt in your water, then there's less room for oxygen, which would in turn affect your the organisms living there. And so, as Joe said earlier, although we don't currently have um, salinity as part of our measurements for the program, that is another reason why we might want to consider it. Because if you have a lot of salt in your lake, it is going to impact the dissolved oxygen in your lake. 
Thanks, Tamara. Um, I see one more question in the chat, and this is from Helen. Um, what is the reason for the differing depth interval measurements for dissolved oxygen? For example, it seems to start out every five feet and then a shorter interval and then every 10 feet. Yep, that's a good question. Um, it starts out with um, bigger intervals, though, every five feet, because we're expecting in Michigan, most lakes will have a pretty large epilimnion where the temperature and the DO doesn't change much. And so it does, we don't need to measure it quite as often. And then um, at some point, we know you're going to hit that thermocline where the temperature drops more quickly. So we want you to measure more often, which is those two and a half feet increments. And then at some point, you'll get down into the hypolimnion where temperature and dissolved oxygen is not going to change very often again. And that's when you go back to the every five feet. All right, thanks. Um, David made a comment in the chat uh, that several used YSI meters are available to purchase on eBay at considerably reduced price. So thanks for sharing that little bit of insight. Um, and one thing I'll, I'll remind on that is, um, you know, one of the things that's important is if you're going to be collecting data that you want included in the MyCore database, you need to use one of our, our approved meters. Um, as, as David mentions, YSI, right now we're using 550s and Pro 20s. So um, if you're thinking about buying your own meter, it's, it doesn't hurt to reach out to us to make sure that you're getting one of the models that, that um, we have procedures and methods for using so we can offer the support that you might need. And another thing to think about if you are looking to purchase one is that my understanding is that the 550As, they're not making parts for them anymore. So we were able to get a new cable for one of ours that wasn't working earlier this year, but that's just until they, that, that part supply runs out. So that's just something to consider. Um, I would go for it. And the Pro 20 is a little bit easier to use. So if you're going to purchase one, um, I would go with the Pro 20. Okay. 